So um, today I'm going to, to introduce to you a, um, a new program that uh, Bocconi, uh, our university has just launched, which is uh, called uh, uh, Mathematical and Computing Sciences for Artificial Intelligence. And I'll try to uh, explain and clarify why it's important to have a very solid background in order to um, give contribution and, and apply and develop uh, tools that are will be relevant in the say in the digital world of the future okay um, so what I'm, I'm going to, to to show you and to discuss with you is that if you want to give contribution to the field of AI in the future what you need to know you need to have a, a solid background in the mathematics in computer science in modeling sciences such as physics and economics and others and 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 then uh, uh, merge this knowledge with the knowledge we have in, in learning theory in AI in intelligent systems and uh, because all these um, methods and tools are needed to, to understand and to build the system uh, of the future okay so this is a, a new program um, that involves different fields of knowledge and uh, where the faculty is composed of top scientists in, in the different fields that the Bocconi University has just recently hired and um, and it is a program that is going to give you a very modern and very um, um, solid methodological background that is going to give you a lot of freedom of choice in your future because building on this knowledge you will be able to decide at the master level to make the best choice for your uh, say desires and dreams and for the job you want to do and for the say the, the, the academic program you want to follow um, <clears throat> building on the uh, understanding and on the, the the tools and the methods that you learn in this bachelor program this program is quite unique worldwide because in for instance in the us the bachelor program is organized uh, structurally in a different manner so it's difficult to provide already in the first years all this all the information that we are going to provide here and and also for europe it's rather innovative you find very very few if any programs that are so advanced in this uh, in this direction so um, let me start by saying that this is a program about methods and uh, computational mathematical methods that are useful for AI but we should clarify what we mean when we say AI and uh, we are not thinking about we are not talking about thinking machines thinking machines do not exist and as far as we know for the moment uh, we have no real uh, idea of when uh, and this may happen uh, certainly not very soon but uh, this doesn't mean that something uh, hasn't happened in, in the recent years uh, actually uh, in the recent years something very important has happened and when we talk about AI we don't mean the thinking machines that you see in movies but it means something else and this is what I want to clarify to you and uh, it's something different and yet extremely extremely important it's going to change the way we do science the way we solve problems in the society the way we do business a lot of with the way we take decision decisions uh, and so on so um, scope of this short uh, conversation is to actually explain what AI is today and in particular try to explain you that current AI uh, concerns uh, a set of tools that allow us to augment our cognitive capability our capability of analyzing data extracting models building new theories uh, learn uh, causal mechanisms and so on and so forth so I will try briefly to tell you how it works and what it means that these tools may have superhuman performance and also I'll tell you when all this has happened in order to, to justify why we have 
develop this new program and why it is relevant and why it will be relevant for the future. Okay. Um, another thing that I should mention is that this program has been designed after two years of uh, discussion at international level about what is it important to teach to young students today in order to be to make them uh, kind of uh, active actors in the uh, say AI of the future. Okay, so this program has been discussed at this, with many scholars and colleagues at the, uh, in many countries, and we agreed essentially that the kind of topic we are teaching here are what is actually relevant and important for uh, to, for the future. Now, um, so in order to tell you what is AI uh, today, let me say one thing: is that the one thing I want to say is that even before the, we, we start thinking about what it means to, um, to uh, build a, a thinking machine, something that we cannot do at the moment, we need, in any case, to have a machine that is capable of giving some input, which can be you know, the, the image or the sound coming from outside or some data that you have extracted but with some new technology about a particular topic or whatever. We need a machine that is capable of from this very complex and, and huge amount of data to actually extract the relevant information. It's like what happens in our visual system. We see images and then our brain elaborates the image in different area of our brain, um, visual, so-called visual areas, and these different uh, modules extract different type of information concerning uh, the image that we have just seen. So we are, um, the information is progressively uh, elaborated until the, you know, the relevant information is extracted and then this is used to, um, <clears throat> to assess what is in the input or to take decision or to, to think somehow. That, and, and what we need is a machine that is capable of doing this and it's capable of learning from the data that it sees. This has been done and this is what is, is actually happening today. And this allows to, to, to analyze text, sound, images, and many, many other things, as we will see. So we are not really, if you want to make an analogy with the brain or so, we are not really talking about what you know, the, the creative thinking part of the brain is doing, but we are talking about the processing of information, of external information in the first stages, okay? Um, you know, the, the, the visual system, for instance, in the brain has been developed through evolution uh, and it's a very sophisticated system. So this is already a highly non-trivial operation that, you know, was not possible a few years ago. In order to understand why it's important to have a machine that it can actually uh, give a meaning to the data and identify what is important in the data, um, let me try to give you this example that I often uh, discuss um, <clears throat> about how would you deal with a traditional, say, approach uh, to artificial intelligence in order, for instance, to detect whether in a given image there is a certain object. I take as an object the chair, for instance. Huh? So you want to build a machine, a program or something that automatically, given a, a picture, is going to tell you, well, in this picture there is a chair, in this picture there's not a chair. So what you would do is, well, you would write a program in your favorite language, Python, C++, or any language that you probably at the moment don't know, but that we learn for sure at the university. And, um, <clears throat> and you know, the, the program you would write would sound something like, well, if the object has, say, four legs, if it has a flat surface to sit on, and if it has a backrest, then it is a chair. And, uh, okay, this is a kind of a logical approach. And this, you know, is, let me say, it's how old AI would have approached this problem. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and you see that it works perfectly for the first example of chair, but for the second example, it doesn't work because it doesn't have four legs, but it has five wheels. And so what you actually have, would have to do is to go back and modify your programs a program and substitute the first uh, rule uh, as follows. You should write, if it has four legs or five wheels, then 
given all the other conditions, it's a chair. But again, this program would not work for the third chair because the third chair has been produced in Milan with some very uh, <clears throat> fancy design, and so it doesn't have uh, legs or wheels, but it has some curly uh, structure. And, and so you would have to modify, even though it's difficult even to define what that is, you have to define your program order to, in order to recognize also that object. But again, you know, this, this would not, uh, uh, then if you present this other type of chair, it would not work again. So you see, for each new example, you would have to modify your code. And so, uh, you know, it's almost impossible to imagine to, to write a deductive system which is capable of recognizing objects because you would have to have somehow the knowledge of what is the essence of a chair, the essence of the object that is common to all the, the objects in order to recognize, recognize them. And this is just not available and, you know, not probably even possible. But, you know, uh, the key point here is that, in fact, what we... Uh, we really need to do is not to a priori define this kind of code, but we need to learn from the examples. You know, the reason is that there are millions of type of chairs, we cannot modify the code, but we know that we can, are able to recognize all these chairs very easily. If you look at the single pictures here, you will immediately recognize all the chairs. And how do you do that? Well, you've learned from examples. And, and this is the, is the key point. So modern artificial intelligence is about um, programs, it's about uh, machines that uh, learn from example to extract information, uh, information and take decision based on this information. This can be applied to, to all the possible uh, uh, fields of, say, of knowledge, not only to images, no, but to sound, to chemical data, biological data, of course, economic and social data, and so on and so forth. So, uh, quite often you hear the word uh, artificial neural networks, deep networks, deep learning, and so on. Why do you hear these words? Because the tool that has given the major contribution to modern AI are actually these, these so-called deep networks. And, uh, and they have, you know, they, their use has changed really the game in the last decade. So let me try to define very briefly what a, a deep network is. This is a device that learns from example to recognize objects given in the input. So the network is composed of many layers, say from the left to the right, you know, see? The data, the image or the sound or whatever data is uh, injected from the left, and then it's propagated from the left to the right through all these layers. And each node uh, is a, a unit which behaves more or less like a, a, a biological neuron in the sense that each circle, each node, receives the input from all the links that you see from the, the previous layer. And, uh, and then uh, if the sum of all this input is above a certain level, then it emits a signal to the subsequent layer. So just look at the blue example uh, here. You see that this node uh, receives uh, uh, all the inputs from, say, the, the, the layer before. And if the sum of this input is above a certain level, it, it's going to transmit the signal to, to the others. So you see that you have this kind of propagation. So you, you insert a signal from the left, and then it propagates, and it reaches the, uh, uh, the output layer on the right. And the output, the activities of, of, of this node here in the output are telling you how the system classifies the input. For instance, if the input is an image containing a chair, then you would want the unit corresponding to the label chair to become active. Right? Somehow, the, the, the output layer is the answer of the nectar to the question what is in the input, okay? And uh, so these are very briefly the, the <clears throat> artificial neural network in a few words. And uh, these systems are huge in the sense that this is just a little picture. Normally, the number of connections, the number of uh, links that you see are of the order of hundreds of millions. So these are huge, huge objects. And the, and the, the key observation is that each link in this system uh, uh, 
can be either, say, strong or weak. You know? It's like a tube in which a lot of fluid can flow or, or, or a little amount of uh, fluid can flow. So somehow the behavior of the whole system is determined by the value that, uh, uh, associated to each of the links. So when you somehow, if you want to uh, fix the behavior of this system, you need to specify the values of these millions and millions of parameters. And this cannot be done a priori, but what, what's going to happen is that the system itself, by seeing a lot of examples, adapts the links, the values of the links, um, in such a way that at the end, the system is capable of behaving correctly and extracting information. I will show you this in a minute, okay? I, as I've said, these are huge system that can contain hundreds of millions of parameters. And then this, in real application, these uh, networks are organized in modules and give rise to very complicated uh, architecture that uh, have shown fantastic behavior, as we will see in a lot of uh, uh, applications. So how does learning take place? This is a key uh, message that I want to give you that, you know, it's useful in, independently on, on whether we discuss about this new program or not. It's just interesting. Okay? Uh, the idea is that you provide an example. So you provide, for instance, an image on the left, and, and you look at the output. Let's say that you want to build a network that recognizes the presence of, of an object in, in, the, in the picture you're providing in input. If the network, at the beginning, the weights of the links, so are all random. So given a certain input, the output of the network will be just random, okay? So typically it will be wrong. And uh, so what happens is that you present an image, you, you observe a wrong answer. At that point, uh, a program sets in, which is going to modify a little bit the value of all the weights in such a way that the, the output node that uh, encodes the right answer is going to be become more active okay so the idea is that you uh, by uh, iteratively you present a lot of example and each time you check whether the answer is correct or not and then you modify the weights until over a huge set of examples the network is capable of correctly classifying all the examples at the same time so you have to repeat this operation of correcting, you cycle through all the data millions of times, and you adjust all the weights millions of times until all the data are correctly classified. Yeah? For instance, you give a lot of examples of chairs and non-chairs, and you continue to adapt the, the weights of your uh, network until on all the examples that you have given, the network gives the correct answer. At this point, you know, the, the, the magic happens, because at this point, you can present to the network something that it has never seen, and by looking at the output, you have a prediction. You have the answer of uh, the, 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 the the answer that the network gives about the input. Okay, so it becomes uh, a way of uh, um, learning and making prediction and and generalizing. So this is very very uh, useful. And what is important? Uh, so here again, and this can be applied, you know, to all sorts of data. I've used this example of images, but this is used very much in in cell biology, molecular biology, neuroscience, physics, chemistry, geophysics, astrophysics, and so on. In medicine, it, it has a huge importance. Social science, economic, finance, uh, services, engineering, human activities, in particular natural language process is, is doing, uh, <coughs> uh, is making a lot of progress. Now, the important thing uh, about this, uh, the, about, sorry, about this learning procedure is that as the learning proceeds, what happens is that in the first layer of the network, uh, the, the, <clears throat> in the first layer uh, of the network, specialize and learn how to classify the input. Uh, sorry, how, what is relevant in the input, okay? So somehow the network learns, first of all, to given a certain input or picture to decompose this picture in relevant feature, and then the last layer learn how to de use this decomposition to take a decision. So you see, it, it has a double uh, scope here. There's a double um, phenomenon going on here. Uh, first, the network learns how to decompose the input. So learns what is relevant for a given task. 
in the data and then uses this task to perform a, a prediction. And this is extremely important. And this is what makes the difference between modern AI and old AI. Okay. In particular, uh, so um, in particular, in the uh, in old AI, what uh, we tried to do, I mean, 20 years ago or so, is to say, well, given a certain image, for instance, we check whether certain characteristics are features are present in the image, and we have predefined which are these features. Like, let's say we want to dis discriminate between cats and dogs, and we believe that having triangular ears is fundamental for for discriminating the two type of animals. Then we check whether the, there are some triangles in the in the in the image or things like this. So we have a list of features that we define a priori, and then based on the presence of this feature, we we give an answer. It's a bit like the example of the chair. So we check, you know, if all the a certain set of features, like uh, in the case of chairs, were, were the number of legs, uh, the backrest, and so on. In the case, the case of animals, would be other things are present, and based on this, we take a decision. This doesn't work. Doesn't work. The performance are bad. On the contrary, the modern system in which this network that I've shown you before modify their, their weights until they learn all the example. They do, for them, you don't need the, the, some features that are this, uh, defined a priori, but they learn but themselves by themselves, they learn what is relevant in the images. And based on this, they take a decision. This is called end-to-end -end learning, and this has led to an enormous progress. Okay. So, um, so today when we talk about AI, what we really mean is machine learning. And machine learning uh, is a set of tools that uh, um, that are actually uh, learning from examples through different uh, techniques. One is uh, the supervised learning that somehow I've described to you with this uh, adaptation of the weights depending on, on the output. Then there is other there are other types of, of learning like unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. We will see uh, what, what they mean very briefly. Okay. And there are a lot of different tools. And the, the one that has had the greatest impact during the last decade is, is deep learning, is the, the, the technique based on the architecture that I've just described to you. And I should mention that also from a theoretical point of view, we don't completely understand all the phenomenon taking place here. We observe that they work very well, but there are a lot of open problems in making building a theory of learning. So it's a very active field of thought and research and, uh, and application. Okay, so one word about when this all this happened. Uh, all these new things happened in uh, around 12, uh, 2012, namely when uh, some researchers from Canada in particular uh, started to use one of these networks to solve and, uh, to, and participate to a competition uh, based on a data set called ImageNet. ImageNet is a set of images collected from the web, which is, uh, I think it has about 20 million images. And the, um, the competition consists in identifying whether a given image from this set contains one among a thousand different possible objects. Okay? And um, we'll see some examples uh, in the next slide. But what I want to say is that in 2011, the best algorithm for recognizing the presence of object made 26% of error, which is bad compared to 5% of error, uh, which is made by humans. And in 2012, by using one of these architecture, neural architecture, this researcher could bring the error down by 10%. So they shifted from 26% to 16%. And since then, this architecture has been improved, this uh, deep networks uh, method has been improved, and nowadays, the error that this uh, system make in uh, recognizing object is far below uh, the error that human makes. So they are superhuman in this sense. So in this, for this specific application, you can reach superhuman performance. And of course, you can also use it you can also process at the same time a massive amount of images. So it's also superhuman in the amount in, in this sense. And so in the sense of the amount of uh, information it can process per unit of time. Now, this is uh, the, the typical so uh, the typical answer of, of this network. So for instance, if you observe the image on the left, that what the network can, uh, is able to do is to first of all bound the single object by, by a box and then to associate to each box a label and the probability of the label. So for instance, in the, uh, the box on the left, 
the, the method says that there is a car with probability one, so 100%. So in the second one, the blue box, there is a dog with a probability which is 99.7%. Then in the light blue one, there is a horse with the probability of 99.3% and so on. You see, so you see, given an image, you get uh, a classification of all of, of everything is inside the image. Eh? Likewise, you can have uh, you know dog, uh, an image uh, in which you have a cat and a dog and the network is capable of uh, discriminating between the two very efficiently, even though no a priori information or, or about cats and dogs has been given. Okay, so uh, so this network learned, you know, to to this to what is relevant actually in the input in order to to take uh, that decision. And um, this is the reason why we hear and we read about self-driving cars, even though we, we don't really see them much around at the moment. And the reason is that the visual system of a car, which is made of a lot of cameras, also uh, probably infrared and whatever, so it's a very, very rich visual system, um, using this kind of uh, machine learning technique is capable of recognizing everything about the surroundings. So the car sees what is, uh, what is happening around. Okay, so for instance, it sees that there is a bike, that there is another car, that there is a lane and, and whatever. What is less obvious is how the car takes a decision based on this. And this is still kind of an open problem, which requires, let me say, human-like thinking. And for this, you know, there are still some, some uh, problems to be solved, quite a, quite a lot. Uh, but on the other hand, we, if you are talking about self-driving car, is because now we can actually recognize efficiently what, what's happening, okay? Uh, there are a lot of other applications, so let me mention this one, which, is, which could be very important, is to use these networks to, to analyze uh, mammographies to detect uh, breast cancer. And uh, th this network can learn from examples to discriminate between um, <clears throat> malignant, banning, and, and normal tissue. And, uh, and so by using this, uh, um, this system, one could do mass uh, ma a screening of a huge number of mammographies and so do mass screening and try to actually anticipate uh, the onset of bre breast cancer in a lot of women. And uh, so this would be a fantastic tool just because we do not have enough radiologists to do this job. And hopefully in the near future, we will see this uh, uh, applied in practice. Now, why are we talking about these things today? Well, because there are three elements that have determined the, the the, the rise of this new technique. One, uh, one is a conceptual, mathematical, and sort of an algorithmic uh, progress. So there's been a lot of programs from the point of view of models, algorithms, and tools and, uh, uh, to design these, uh, these devices. But on a practical side, the, the computational power has increased really a lot in the last uh, 15 years, in particular thanks to the GPU that uh, have been built originally for uh, for uh, gaming PC uh, and then have been used to do scientific computations. So a lot of labs were, thanks to, to this gaming PC, were able to actually uh, uh, make a lot of very uh, powerful, very challenging simulations uh, at a very low cost because these these computers are very cheap compared to the dedicated uh, hardware for scientific computations. And so all of a sudden, since 2000, you know, between 2005, 2010, uh, a lot of labs could start doing a lot of experiments and, and, and so. And, uh, and the other thing is that also the data have increased a lot. All the new technologies in the different fields uh, provide uh, data, I mean, in medicine, in economics, in finance, in, you know, weather, climate change, uh, and whatever. And uh, <clears throat> so there's a lot of, a lot of new information that we can process. It's a huge amount and we need tools to process this information to make progress, right? So just to give you an example of how the, the flow of data is pervasive uh, 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 when every day you upload on Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp about 2 billion images, which are immediately sent to this uh, 
uh, machines that use this information to improve their performance, okay? So in the last, say, more or less eight years, what has happened is that this tool has been applied to speech recognition. I mean, nowadays you can use on your cell phone, if you use Google Translate, you can speak in a language and hear uh, your sentence translated into another language automatically. And this, you know, is something totally uh, recent. It was not possible 10 years ago to do this. Right? And it's kind of a spectacular. Object recognition is, again, uh, very, very important in many fields. Then you can analyze molecular data for, for personalized medicine. Um, you can do automatic translation. Uh, you can do a lot, a lot of application uh, uh, across fields, right? And you probably don't realize, but already a lot of the tools that you use, use uh, adopt these technologies uh, inside them, okay? So just to, to, to synthesize, for instance, you know, uh, already a couple of years ago, it was possible to provide an image to this network and then uh, identify what was present in the image and then through some language generated network, again, trained in, in similar ways, uh, write a text describing what was in the image. So you have a totally automatic system that goes from an image to a text describing the image. So this is kind of incredible. Again, there's not, creativity here, there's not real thinking. It's just, you know, a way of uh, elaborating information, which is extremely powerful for, uh, and extremely important to, to, to uh, in many applications. Now, why do you need a lot of math? Why do you need a lot of computer science? Well, computer science, because you have to optimize these devices. You need modeling technique because you have to make models. And you need a lot of math because you have to also formalize things and understand how they, they actually behave. Just to make uh, one aspect which is important is that the data we are dealing with are high dimensional. So you don't have to think to data as points that you can draw on a Cartesian, Cartesian uh, uh, <coughs> um, plot, say, um, because uh, uh, data are, real data are difficult to visualize because there are a lot of components, okay? So for instance, let's take a person. A person is characterized by a lot of uh, numbers like you know the age, the weight, the height, the gender, the country of origin, uh, the color of the eyes. But not only this; it could be the character. Uh, you know, a lot of characteristics. Say so. Each characteristic, each feature is is a dimension. So in order to characterize a person, you probably need you know tens or hundreds or, or thousands of, of, of these numbers. And so, and, and so you see that these are not just simple points, but are a string of numbers that can be very complicated. So data are very complicated. Or if you analyze text also, you know, text, and you want to find connection between words uh, in a text, say, for instance, here I have highlighted the, uh, uh, the subject and the verb corresponding to that. And, you know, there are a lot of connections that are far away on, in the text. And so if you want to represent this, you need a very high dimensional, uh, uh, say, space. And so text, images, uh, and everything can be represented in high dimensional space, which is, goes beyond, beyond and not just a two dimensional space. So here's what we would see in two dimension, so just to, for the sake of plotting something. But this, you know, it's difficult to give order in, all, in, in this mess. And so you really need a lot of... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, or some automatic tool to analyze this, this data. And, you know, this is very powerful. And for instance, uh, network that have learned to analyze text uh, using the, this example are able nowadays to write incredible articles which look, which look like, look very, very realistic. They look as written by human, uh, but uh, they, in fact, they are not written by humans. Uh, they are able to do this because we, give some input to this system, you know, for the logic behind the text. But the text itself is really written by the machine, which is incredibly spectacular. Um, so this is an example, even a simple image like this uh, digit nine, uh, it can be thought of as a, a lot of uh, uh, numbers, each number describing the intensity of a pixel. Okay, and so even you know simple images are defined in a very high dimensional space. So uh, um, another way 
of that this system used for learning is by using this network to decide a strategy with which a certain agent, in, agent interacts with the environment. And then, you know, by looking at the feedback that the environment gives to the agent, uh, kind of a reward signal, modify its behavior. Okay, so for instance, let's say this very simple Atari game in which you have a ball that hits a wall and destroys the wall, and the more you destroy the wall, the higher will be your gain, and the machine has to control the position of uh, <clears throat> the paddle here, or whatever, however it, whatever it's called, and so that the ball can bounce and, and hit the wall. So the, 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 the network has to control the position of, of, <clears throat> Uh, of this element in, so that uh, the, the ball bounces, okay? And, you know, it starts playing at the beginning, it gets a lot of negative signals, but so the, the score doesn't go up, but then it adapts its behavior, changes the weights until it learns to actually uh, make the ball bounce in a very efficient way. And not only it learns this, it also learns that it is convenient to send the ball behind the wall, because in this way, a lot of uh, pieces of the wall will be destroyed. Okay, so the, the network learns to behave, to, uh, to make the ball bounce, and also learns a little strategy on how to optimize the um, uh, the, the, the score. And you know, this is a very elementary game, but then this, the same technique has been used to, to play very complicated game like games like Go, which were considered till 2015, 16, uh, out of reach for any computer just because um, it was impossible to explore all the alternatives uh, with brute force. And you know, this, this network that learned by playing one, one against the other turned out to be uh, to become very, very smart in uh, in playing this game and to actually um, build, beat the best human players, okay? And so nowadays, this network uh, can uh, play very sophisticated game uh, by learning from uh, playing to develop uh, new strategies, and uh, they are uh, extremely uh, efficient in, in doing this. And this was considered to be out of reach, uh, just you know, three four years ago. Uh, I mean, this could be could look kind of useless, but it's not useless because this can be applied in many fields. For instance, you can use um, you can have a glider, which is an airplane without an engine that flies because you have a control system that exploits the wind in order to, to make this airplane fly. And this control system is governed by a neural network that has learned from simulations of, of flights to has adapted its weight and, and has learned to fly. So you can, you know, it can be used very useful for robotics and for many, many applications. So this is another little example. This is a virtual world in which you have the bad guys that are the red guys and the good guys that are the blue one. And the red uh, sends a, a, a terrible, uh, um, <clears throat> shoots the, the, the signal to, to the blue and, and gets a reward for that. And the blue gets a negative reward for that. And so they have to learn how to move around this world in order to, to avoid, the, the blue has to be, avoid being hit by the red, and the red has to try to hit the blue. And, you know, after a while, the blue guys learn to block the doors so that they cannot be hit, but then the red learns how to, to use a ramp to go beyond the wall, the wall. And, and so, um, and so again, they can uh, uh, hit the blue guys, but then the blue guys learn that before closing the door, they have to take away the ramp. So you see that uh, just this is again a little uh, example, totally virtual, in which uh, uh, you see kind of uh, intelligent behavior arising from example and experience. Of course, this kind of approach cannot be used everywhere because you need to be able to simulate the system uh, from which you want to learn because you cannot, for instance, in the case of uh, self-driving cars, uh, make a, a, a huge number of accidents before you learn how to avoid making accidents, okay? So in realistic situation, this kind of learning cannot be applied because you cannot just, you know, make a lot of accidents before you learn to avoid the accident. Uh, so you need to be able to simulate the world around you in order to apply this kind of technique. Uh, another thing which is kind of nice is that another application, I'm just giving to you a few examples here and there just to give you an idea, um, is the fact that, um, 
suppose, uh, as I mentioned to you, this network can learn to recognize objects. In particular, this network can learn to discriminate between an image which is a fake image, so for instance, manipulated through Photoshop or some other program, and a true image of a natural scene, okay? And so you have a network, let me call it discriminator network, that through learning, so by seeing a lot, a lot of fake and true images, is able to discriminate between the two, and is able to do it with uh, uh, an error that is lower than the error of humans, right? So you have a very good discriminator of reality versus fake. But then you can train another network by making these two networks uh, play one against the other. You can, you can train, you can build, design a new network that generates images uh, that are, cannot be discriminated by the discriminator. So essentially you can train another network to actually generate images that look very realistic, according to the discriminator, which is better than human in discriminating uh, reality. And so this can be done. And, uh, and so, for instance, if you do this, uh, <coughs> uh, we have a problem with the... Uh, okay, so for instance, once you've done this, you might provide to the generator an image like this, in which a lot of the the information has been deleted and the network is going to complete this information by adding bits it has never seen this image in a very realistic way so you see this image look very realistic or you can give this kind of input to the generator and it completes uh, the image in this way and you know the discriminator is going to say that this is a person it's a true person even though this person does not exist at all and it's the same for this guy here right um, or, just to give you another idea of how it works, if you start with this image and you delete the information that there is a person behind the bars and you give this to the generator, the generator is going to complete the image in this way because the, 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 the image is going to look like realistic and of course it cannot inject any information that you have deleted. Okay. Uh, another example of how it works is by looking at this uh, image here. You have, suppose you have a low resolution image you give it to the generator, and then the generator is going to uh, inject new pixels in such a way that the image looks more realistic. So it's going to implement a super resolution. Okay, this is you know it can so you can have an image which is horrible in low resolution, and, and, and the system is able to give you back an image in high resolution. And this can have application in medicine and radiology and many many fields. Okay, good. So I just give you. Uh, a set of examples of what's going on and um, and you know you, you can if you navigate on, on, on the web you can really uh, find a huge number of application across all disciplines okay so in, in molecular biology if you want to for instance even gene editing this technology that allows you to modify the DNA in a cell uh, the way it's it has been optimized is by using some machine learning tools in order to optimize the technique. I'm just saying that the, all these tools uh, are used to, uh, um, <clears throat> to improve uh, our uh, scientific method and our, the method we use to, to, make, uh, to make progress. For instance, again, last year a new antibiotic was uh, discovered by using one of these networks. Um, and, and so on. New materials have been discovered and uh, hopefully uh, <clears throat> uh, a lot of other applications that uh, uh, you know, are kind of very uh, hot today and very important today. Um, things that we have to learn to do are, for instance, one, one very important uh, progress that needs to be made is to use this network to make causal prediction, meaning not only find the correlation between uh, <clears throat> say uh, data in the in, uh, in input data, but also use this network. We want this network to become capable of understanding what causes what in a given set of data. Okay, and this is going is difficult and you know something all the community is working on. And once this is reached, even you know partially, then it's going to lead to an enormous progress in. in you know, all the fields of application, which again are at 360 degrees. And then there are a lot of other issues that I don't even want to, to mention here. Just, I just want to say that um, modern AI is, a, is something which is pervasive across disciplines. 
uh, is going to uh, remain in our tool and to be in our set of tools and is going to be become more and more important in the future and it's a uh, under certain aspects quite complicated to understand and so we need tools to understand and, and, and to make progress okay but uh, but this is what is happening today and what's going to happen in the future and it's going to be very very important and hopefully leading to, to important discoveries and applications that can you know kind of uh, improve our world um, so we, what we for sure will observe in the near future are a lot of discoveries across all disciplines thanks to the application and to the development of, of AI tools and uh, at certain point there will be bigger revolution but this can be you know are difficult to predict somehow um, as I said just in science uh, the application are uh, nowadays pervasive even you know, going from molecular biology to astrophysics, people are using this, uh, the, these techniques in medicine, in economics, and so on, in neuroscience. And the machine learning itself is a scientific field. I mean, understanding how this system works uh, beyond you know, the empirical observation is really an important uh, point, uh, which needs to be understood. And this is just to mention, mention science. Of course, in, there are a lot of technological and social applications and business applications. Uh, the way this, um, these things work uh, is different from how we work or how children uh, learn. This should be said. So even in this direction, there is a lot of progress to be made. We are still far from, from this situation. Just to give you an example, you know, uh, uh, children, um, you know, builds a model of the environment uh, progressively. For, so, for instance, if you have a baby which is seven months old, it doesn't have the notion of gravity. So, for him, object could fly. They do not necessarily have to fall down. But around the age of eight months, it, he develops the notion of gravity. So, he learns that in his world, so in his model of the world, which is the world that he has to deal with every day, object, object have to fall down, okay? And, uh, and, uh, and so uh, somehow the way baby work, uh, learn is by making predictions of the model they have of their surrounding world and comparing these predictions with the observation. And this is not what the way neural network uh, uh, work. They need a lot of data. They are you know, kind of more, uh, they, need, they need massive amount of data. So there are some uh, things that uh, make it substantially different. And, uh, and still, so also in this direction, there's a lot of progress to, uh, to be made. So just to say that we have observed some very, very important improvements that have changed science and society and are going to be uh, to change science and society in the near future and, you know, probably and even more in the uh, uh, next future. Okay. Um, so for this reason, we decided to, given the situation, given the digital world, given the fact that all these things are happening, we, uh, all the university are, you know, kind of trying to define new programs. And we have come out with this uh, quite innovative uh, uh, bachelor degree, which is at the international level quite a, a novelty, as I mentioned at the very beginning, and um, which is about teaching all those tools that are necessary to understand the system and to develop new systems, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> so the idea is that Current and future AI require a vast body of knowledge. And so we need to give to the students the essential methodological background so that they can uh, address the challenge uh, with rigor and with creativity and, uh, and make progress, okay? And we need to, need, we need to teach uh, topics that, uh, and concepts that do not age uh, quickly, right? So something that is really important and will remain important uh, in the future. And so uh, this is the idea. Uh, <clears throat> so we are going to teach all the math, all the computer science, all the physics, all the economics, all these in the sense of physics and economics in the sense of modeling sciences that are important for, for uh, uh, the development of these tools. And of course, we are teaching what we know about these tools. So all these things together, okay? And the scope is to give you the opportunity to the student, the opportunity of be, uh, <clears throat> you know, at the center, at the root of uh, the emergence of new knowledge. Okay, and you know, to be able to grasp all the novelties and to develop new things. 
Okay. Um, um, okay, let me go, let me explain this by looking at the, the study plan so that you, you know, so what the idea that we, we are implementing is to develop in parallel math, computer and modeling techniques and then to merge them in, in, uh, in, uh, with the machine learning. Uh, so for instance, the first year you see you have co two courses in computer science, one uh, in you learn programming and the other you learn the computing theory and algorithms, and these courses are taught by fantastic computer scientists. And so you will really learn uh, the, the important uh, topics in the field. And then you have uh, um, two models of calculus, mathematical analysis. You have algebra and geometry. I just mentioned to you how important is geometry to understand the data. And then uh, <clears throat> analysis is important to look for and understanding the behavior of algorithms and, and so on and so forth. Then you learn probability in the second semester, which is important because all the answers given by the, these machines have a probabilistic nature. And, and then you have courses in, in physics, in mechanics, and, uh, and economics as modeling sciences. And in the course in physics, for instance, important for problem solving uh, skills. And then in the second year, again, you, uh, you continue with the, you see that all these courses are done in parallel and, and you use, for instance, what you've learned in geometry and math to solve, uh, and in programming to solve some physics question and vice versa. So it's really a way of uh, <coughs> merging and you have a cross fertilization of, of the disciplines. And then you have um, the second year, foundation of physics, decision theory, mathematics, statistics, and advanced analysis. So again, methodological and modeling uh, <clears throat> courses. And at the same time, you have uh, advanced programming and optimization algorithm, which are very, very important for learning systems. And then you have the first course in, in machine learning. And, uh, and also you have a, a lab in AIs, so where you will actually learn how to apply these things in a, a, a concrete setting. And you also have, uh, of course, you continue with your uh, uh, <clears throat> understanding of, uh, of calculus and also with, um, with application in physics, like in, uh, <clears throat> in electromagnetism. Okay, but then the thir third year, the third year you really have, you reach the, the uh, you, you start, you will learn the most advanced technique in modeling, uh, modeling technique in natural scientists, sciences like uh, statistics and quantum physics. You will learn game theory and mechanism designs, which are very important in modeling social systems. You will, uh, you will uh, learn mathematical modeling for finance, which is another example of modeling, and which is also approached nowadays with this kind of machine, with, with, with machine learning techniques. Then there are some elective courses which are focused on the topic of the, of the course, like information theory, for instance, which is very, very important. And then in the second semester, you, you, there's a course on stochastic process and simulation, which is very important because you need to simulate properly a system in, in order to, to, for instance, to implement a, a learning procedure. And so it's, it's, it's extremely important. And then you have an advanced course in machine learning and AI. And then you also have a course in uh, mathematical modeling for neuroscience in which that it allows you to make a little bridge between the, the, the machine learning and, and, and neuroscience. So you see that uh, uh, across the, the, the years, you start with very, very basic uh, uh, knowledge in which you mix the most important topics in computer science, in math and in modeling. And, and then you merge this with, uh, with AI uh, courses. So at the end, uh, of this process, you, have, you would have, you would, it's like a, a mountain that you have to climb. And once you have climbed this mountain, you have made such an important conceptual path that uh, you will be very, very strong from, uh, from a methodological and conceptual point of view. And you will be able to choose essentially whatever future you want, uh, as far as academic choices is concerned, and also as far as job is concerned, because with such a background, it's very easy to choose uh, a field of application of specialization and so on, okay? So this is the, the, the philosophy behind the, um, <clears throat> the course. And uh, as a researcher, I'm totally, uh, as a scientist, I'm totally sure that uh, a student with such a background, it's, it's going to be a very precious figure in the future of science because it has all it has all those tools that are really important nowadays in essentially across all the the, the scientific fields and and also in, in 
in concrete application and in, in business. And the idea here is that we are reversing the, the path. So we're going to first in the, in the bachelor teach the, the, the methods and then with the idea that in the master program you can choose and specialize in the field that you uh, dream about. 